Hey everyone, uh, my name is Nicole Martinelli and I am here to talk about a young project that is called Resiliency Maps. And you know, we all know how great OSM is in a disaster. Um, and Ross before was talking about uh, how much it can be used for the SDGs. And if you go on the Humanitarian Open Street Map Task Manager right now, you could do something about what's happening uh, with Hurricane Dorian in the Barbados. So my whole point is you can actually use it a little closer to home. I started out uh, volunteering with HOT, um, partially because I was moved as a San Francisco native from what was happening in Nepal. I felt a real affinity with that. Um, but I didn't really think about using it closer to home. So this is, these are images from the Loma Prieta quake, which is almost exactly 30 years ago. And in the next 30 years, the USGS is predicting we'll have another one of at least similar magnitude. Now, I had gone through the what we call in San Francisco, after the Loma Prieta quake, they realized that there were nowhere near enough emergency personnel to handle the problem. And people, there are all these great images of people with the regular people running fire hoses and clearing out debris. And so they started this program called the Neighborhood Emergency Response Team. And now it's a nationwide program, um, but we still call it that. Nationwide FEMA calls it CERT. So it's Community Emergency Response Team. And I had done that training, but I didn't really think about using it much for San Francisco, in part because the neighborhood I lived in looked like this. So uh, I knew where everything was. I figured, this is the inner sunset. I figured, you know, that's Golden Gate Park. Worst case scenario, you pop a tent. Uh, that church has a big open, unfenced schoolyard. There's a giant supermarket that you could kind of get supplies from. There's a library down the street that you could shelter in. And in San Francisco, not all of the fire stations are gonna be working in emergency. Um, but the battalion was within walking distance. So I was like, I'm good. And then I moved to a neighborhood that looks like this. So this is San Francisco south of Market. Uh, the view was cranes. And in San Francisco, your ground underfoot is always a little unsteady. There are these terrifying USGS maps of basically, yes, I can see your grimace there. There's, it's all landfill or like old ships or whatever, sand. Um, so anytime you have construction, that's obviously a problem. It was, it's a neighborhood with also a lot of more industrial things, so anything that could blow up, right? Um, mechanics, paint shops, um, and a lot more soft story buildings, which we'll talk about a little bit more, but those are the ones you want to look out for in a disaster. So my background is in journalism, and I wanted to see if my hunch, or rather my terror, was correct. So there's a lot of great open data in SF, and this is a mashup of 36 different data sets that the health department turned into this thing that they're calling the Community Resiliency Indicator. And you can see here that I went from the inner sunset, which is that light green, to the dark green of south of market. So I went from a four to a two. And that's when I decided that I had to do something. And this concept of resiliency, it's a bit of a buzzword, but it means that you're bouncing back from anything that might disrupt your daily life. Um, I hope you'll leave this with just the right amount of paranoia about these things. Somewhere between sort of que sera, sera and apocalypse now. So, Disasters are geographically agnostic. Earthquakes kill the most people, and there's a pretty good reason for that, right? Thank you, exactly, because they're unpredictable. So you're most likely to die in one of those. But once you get sort of the bug with this mentality, um, it's easy to take it with you. So this is a vintage Red Cross poster, which kind of sums up my mentality now, um, and also tells you everything you need to know about who's willing to go anywhere with me. Uh, because if you start thinking about what kind of assets and hazards you're facing anywhere, you kind of get this idea of, of looking at your surroundings a little differently. So this is a picture I took in, our, in the airport coming here. Um, so it turns out that we are in Tornado Alley. Um, it is tornado season. Uh, and I always look for these things now, I know. Uh, because apparently in tornadoes you shelter in places without windows, so it's gonna be your bathroom. So just, this is, again, once you start looking at these things, they're everywhere, right? Um, and I wanna go through a little bit of a thought experiment. So we have, we're in the lowest risk nationwide, right here in Minneapolis, for any kind of seismic territory. So I'm out of earthquakes, I'm good. We're too far inland for any hurricane stuff. Um, but we, like I said, we are in Tornado Alley, and who are my locals? Is anybody local here? Okay, so you guys can tell me later more about these inline winds, which apparently are more devastating than the actual tornadoes because they just blow out the windows and the roofs. So this is uh, 
a street in Minneapolis after one of the last big tornadoes. And what do you notice about this? It looks like a mess, and people are doing what? Boom. So they are on foot, right? Okay, so in our thought experiment, we're sheltering in place for a tornado here for like 24 hours is usually what they say in any kind of work situation. So let's just go with that. And I think you'll find that you actually have a lot more going for you in a work situation than you would like if you were just going out to walk the dog or heading to the gym or something. So uh, I have, let's, let's do a little quiz. And then I have this really cool multi-tool that I know for a fact that you can get through TSA for the winter. So let's see, what do we have right now? Okay, who has water with them? Not very many people. Okay, who's got some food? Okay, gosh, okay, this is, this is looking a little, a little die here. Who has cell, extra cell phone chargers? So it's like all the same people have all this stuff. I love it. <laughs> Anybody got, um, let's see, if we needed to just sort of Jerry, MacGyver, like, uh, Band-Aids, hand sanitizer, anything that you could use for... This is literally the first time this has happened. Okay, so again, usually when you're at a conference, everybody has anything. Um, is anybody like Red Cross trained? CPR, anything? CPR, I, I'll take it. I will, absolutely, I'm taking it. I will take expired, okay, that's good. So you read, we have some Red Cross trained people. Anybody in the ham radio operators? Yes, okay, all right. This is literally the first time I've ever been in such an unprepared group of people. Because, uh, I think the gentleman there with the coffee wins the multi-tool because you, you seem to have more things. No, does anybody have a scarf for anything? So you, you're, you're the winner. Because again, a scarf, anything of fabric, you could use it to cover your eyes. You could, they don't do tourniquets anymore, but sling an arm in it, um, use it as a pillow. If you really want to get crazy with the prepper stuff, go look up like things you can do with a bandana. Just, it never ends. So usually my point when I show this is that the only, oh, and he's showing the bandana. You are the winner, sir. <laughs> yes, yes. And I will hand you this thing now. Wait, it's super cool. Yeah, no, I keep it around. Uh, this, is, this is your mentality. Uh, this guy Boy is, Scout. <laughs> see, it's Boy Scouts. That totally works. So you can get that through TSA. You can also like clip it in your hair if you want. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, beard maybe? I don't know. Yeah, but so, and also the local people, because I, did, it, did any of my local folks drive here? What, you're like, we're unprepared. Did you drive? Do you have an emergency kit in your car? Okay, so she's our friend now. Do you, you, do you happen to have a paper map in your car? Embarrassingly, no. Okay, so usually the point when I do this is like, look, we've got all these things, we're going to be totally okay, but we don't have a map, right? Um, except I don't know how okay we're going to be because, oh, the other thing is anybody staying in a hotel or an Airbnb that does not have an electronic card key? I know, right? So we're stuck here for 24 hours. The thing is you're in a conference center, so you have more amenities than you would if you're at work probably and like sleeping under your desk. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't the first person in the NERP training to realize that we needed maps. I was using an out-of-date tourist map that wasn't even as scale as mine, so you can, yeah, it's, you're good. But I want to show you this map um, because it's obviously problematic, and I don't, I would like to leave off criticizing so much this map as just show you what actually happens. And if this happened in my community, it could happen in yours if you don't evangelize open street maps. So this is a product of a group of very committed nerds spending a couple of weekends with pencil and paper going around their neighborhood and picking out assets and hazards. So these are the police fire call boxes, which we'll get to in a minute. These are fire hydrants. These little houses with the wavy things are the soft spray buildings that you want to avoid. Uh, the towers are high, um, high level construction. The wheelchair symbol, I think that's a place where they now, it's like a rehabilitation center that might be more disabled people that you need to rescue or whatever. So this is obviously problematic. But again, I want to show you this not so much to evoke a criticism of this map because we've all made bad maps and I will show you some questionable ones that I'm still making, but this could happen to you. So these are all people in San Francisco, the technological hub of our country with supercomputers in their pockets and multiple devices at home. And this is what happens. Okay, so this is also just one neighborhood. Like you can see here, 
There's a lot less stuff over there because that's where they drew the boundary. And so outside of that, I don't know what happened. Um, and I wasn't the first person to, to get this idea, like I said, but I had to do a lot of convincing to get them to use OpenStreetMap. Um, and working with this concept of resiliency that I got from the health department and um, this sense of having to make maps that actually work for people, I ended up having to write a bunch of tutorials to convince them to use OpenStreetMap. So every time I thought of it, so they were like, well, how user-friendly is it? Well, what do you want to do? Well, what if we want to use pencil and paper? You can do that. What if we want an app? You can do that. Well, how hard is it to use on a desktop? Let's run a mapathon. And that's basically really how it started. It was like I had to, you have the burden of proof because this is the thing that people, if, again, if they're just using what they're, the first thing that comes to mind, and they will dedicate a lot of time to this. We've had other neighborhoods who've spent two years mapping, and they will go out and map stuff like how many apartment, um, how many people they think live in these apartment buildings. Like they'll count the floors and put all that stuff in. Um, and then they don't have access to the API if it's using a proprietary product, and the whole thing just goes poof. Uh, so this is preaching the converted. These are all the usual suspects. Probably the most important part of this that I wasn't expecting, again, from sort of a technological background, is the print stuff, um, the paper maps. So let's just take a look. Here we are again in our disaster scenario, which is seriously giving me some anxiety right now. But this is just a quick look um, using the humanitarian overlay, which I like because it's very clean. And here we are with the little knife and fork at the McNamara Center. And you can see, just compared to that last, compared to that last slide, what I'm looking at right now, I see, oh, look, there's a fire station. So it's great if you're on a campus or in a conference center also where in the United States, everything's new. Like, I'm going to assume these buildings are all up to code and I can shelter in the loo, right? So there's a fire station. Oh, look, there's also a police station. Uh, and I don't know how it works here, but if I had my NERF badge and I needed supplies and I saw there were some chain stores, I would think about going there to get them. Uh, in California, they can write all this stuff off. So if you've got your little, you know, I am a card carrying nerds, and if you have it on you, you can go and get some stuff if you need it. So maybe that's what we would do, right? Okay. Um, this is a very quick version. Again, speaking of maps that are like, you know, it's more quick and dirty than like the beautiful map. We have a resiliency overlay in OSM-Matic to print stuff. And it has a couple of the just salient features. Um, and here it is again. Here's where we are again. And I like this view a little better because, again, I want to see where the water is because that could be a resource. Uh, the SOS, those are call boxes. And the yellow is highlighting that that's a medical complex, which you can also still see on this map. But again, um, I printed out copies of these, and I have them if you're feeling paranoid along with me. But I do do this everywhere I go now, just so I have an idea of where I am and what <coughs> potentially uh, might happen. So you know, if it was an earthquake, I'd think like, OK, the stadium's right there. Um, tornado, not so much, but that might be a place where they're handing out supplies. Um, again, like we're good because we're on a campus. This building is modern. We have the fire station right there. So I'm going to say, despite that, we're OK. Um, this is a little closer detail of what it looks like in San Francisco, um, and I, the, where you can see the construction. So uh, some local told me that Minnesota has two seasons, winter and construction. So uh, getting a place that had more construction going on would also be useful, because again, if there's stuff flying around, debris, you really don't want to be anywhere that's like a crane or anything flammable. So this is what it looks like in San Francisco. This is the Chase Center. I think my last OSM edit was actually turning that off because they just had the ribbon on it. Um, the black are the soft story buildings, which again, we'll talk about in a second. You can see the fire stations, the call boxes. Again, those are not the, you know, the iconography is huge for the thing, which we'll see in a minute. But again, if, if you were at a concert or something at the Chase Station, uh, great, you're right across the street from also a huge hospital. So, and also if you're trying to get home because you're gonna be what, walking, you're probably not going to, if you can avoid going under that freeway or going under less of it and maybe not around these buildings, that would be a good way to go. Um, so a couple of things that we've done, and I said this is still a young project. This is what these police and fire <coughs> call boxes look like. Now, the interesting thing is there are 2,000 of these in San Francisco. They run on telegraph technology, so hashtag old school. Um, they're the only things that are expected to work in emergency. So. The interesting thing about OpenStreetMap is that you've 
find it. There's, it's in your city and it's also everywhere else. So um, they tried to uh, get rid of these in New York, but they reinstated them and they were still working during Hurricane Sandy. There are some places in Europe that still have them. So um, there's a lot of debate about these and their usefulness, but they're still the things that are most likely to work. Uh, this, so this is it at the interest of Chinatown, obviously, and we did get that tag approved. Now, the other thing that was kind of interesting, uh, soft story. Um, so a soft story building is basically any building where you should have a shear wall, but you do not. And what happens is if you get a good shake, those buildings pancake. And typically, this is a good example because it's also on a corner. A lot of times you can see those are garages, but there'll be like a shop under there or whatever. So you really don't want to be in one of these buildings. And you know, this is a classic San Francisco photo from 30 years ago. We thought this would be a good tab to add, um, but I couldn't find it until I started potato potato, right? Because it's the British spelling with E-Y. So it turned out that the World Bank had already tagged 13,000 buildings in Kathmandu that were also soft story. So uh, that we went through the process of getting it formalized. Um, the terrifying part of this is the public data in San Francisco. Um, this is the San Francisco Department of Building Inspection. We, we have 4,000 of these soft stories after the last 30 years. 2,000 of them have been retrofitted. And they're retrofitted meaning they will not collapse on you, but not that they won't be habitable. So they won't collapse on you, but you're not going to be able to live in them. So there's still 2,000 of them, and this is the varying states of retrofitting they are in at the moment. Um, and you can see the other obvious problem with this is what, folks? Boom, it's in a Google Fusion table, rip. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know what we're gonna, well, I have no idea what they're gonna do with this. Uh, but the other interesting part about this is as far as I know, California has no statewide registry for these and every single county calls it's somebody's, it's like a different person's responsibility. So these data sets are out there. Like in LA, it was actually the LA Times that had compiled the database of them. Um, so they are dangerous. They're expensive to retrofit. You know, my, one of my side projects, I want to redo this so that they really, we change the rentals because people are paying market rent. So live in some of these buildings, which not your best bet. Um, so again, this is one of the mapathons that we did with the nerds and we used field papers. We wanted, like, you guys want to use pen and paper? Let's do it. So we mapped part of the section near the training part of NERT, and they spent a couple hours going around. They were just doing very few tags. And the thing about the soft story buildings is that you're trained to see these buildings. Like, one of the things that's a little weird for me here in Minneapolis is that you have a lot of uh, unreinforced masonry. See, she's laughing good. Every time I see one of those buildings, like for us, it's a heart attack. Like here with a tornado, they're probably okay. But those are another type of building that they teach you to look for because they're just gonna go, they're just gonna crumble. Um, so they were just looking for very specific things and they made a couple hundred edits in a couple of hours. But again, the main thing is with, to try to evangelize, to get people out and thinking about this in their communities. We did another one that was more for the map time folks um, using mapillary as they call it. Uh, and here's an example of, again, of it, where we are now. You can use the street level imagery um, to tag things like fire hydrants because the sad thing is in a lot of these cases, it is easier to go out and do it yourself than get the public data sets. And I'm not even gonna talk about mass importing them. Uh, but yeah, it's actually a lot easier because a lot of these government offices, they don't, it's sort of out of their purview to give it to you, um, which is a problem because in San Francisco, the cost of living is such that about 30% of the emergency personnel can afford to live there, which is part of the reason why NERT is so important. So we're expected to be on our own for a long time. And if we don't know where stuff is, it's kind of a problem. The other thing that they teach you to spot that I don't see here are the white fire hydrants that you can get uh, drinking water out of. And when you take NERT and probably also CERT, they teach you how to open those. So. You know, imagine, again, here, we don't have any food, we don't have any water, but okay. Uh, we, we've just gone to the CVS and got some supplies, so we're okay, but um, <clears throat> what are you gonna do if you don't have water uh, for a significant amount of time? So, San Francisco earthquakes, it's the obvious thing that you think of, but really, resiliency is about any kind of disruption to your community, um, and we do have, more frequently now, heat waves, right? 
and there's no air conditioning in San Francisco. So our typical way to deal with that is open all the windows and wait for the fog to come in. Anytime it gets over about 72. Um, and it's, you know, these are not sexy problems to have. Like, you know, the rock is not going to swoop in and be like, oh, I'm perspiring in San Francisco. But uh, people die. Um, and again, from public data sets, it's pretty easy to figure out where those most vulnerable people are. Um, and if you start thinking with a map mentality and resiliency mentality, you can probably prevent some of that. Um, there's other data sets that will show you um, older people, so percentage of people over 65 living in these places. So again, if you're in that neighborhood, you can go out and do that. Um, wildfires, so this is another thing in the news, it tis the season for wildfires. These are all the fires uh, that are happening right now in, San Francisco, uh, in the Bay Area. And you can see none of them are close to San Francisco, but this matters because PG&E is planning these public safety power shutoffs. So these will happen in San Francisco. Uh, and the preparation is almost exactly like what you need to do for an earthquake. So it's all these things. Oh, I didn't even ask. I bet you have cash on you. Me? Yeah. No, I don't actually. Okay, you still won the prize. Who, does anybody have cash? Okay, so. Wow. Oh, so that's really, we have no food, no water, <laughs> nothing, but we have, so cash is obviously another one of those things that people don't think about, like have some small bills on you. Um, but this, the procedure is basically the same for an earthquake because you're expected to be without power for days, and this is going to affect San Francisco as well. So this is another one of these things that no one thinks about. It's not really that exciting. But again, if because it's not an earthquake and it doesn't happen suddenly, um, my experience with the NERTs and just community people in general is they're super, super committed. So they volunteer at these cooling centers, but the whole point is you gotta get people out to get them to there or just make sure they don't die. Um, so the other thing here is like any place with medical devices. And I like this last one the best. <coughs> if you live or work in a building that has elevator or electronic key cards, like figure that out because obviously that's gonna be a bit of a problem. So that is pretty much it. Um, I hope you will think about maybe making these maps for wherever you live. And I do think OSM can do a lot for these kind of daily disruptions. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Anybody else? Or are you all like scared into <laughs> silence? Have you, have you looked at the homeless population in the Bay Area? Like, have you looked at any of the homeless population in the Bay Area? Like, what are some of the things that you guys do? So that's a really great question. Um, in terms of resiliency and an emergency, that's also something that you could need to do. Part of um, Part of what we've been working with is there are a lot of navigation centers, so to try to do it that way. So in other words, they people sort of know where to go and get supplies and stuff. But yeah, that's another definitely another factor and and difficult to map, but clearly part of the vulnerable population that you could go out and get to a cooling center. Yeah, great idea. Yeah. Obviously, you've tried a lot of maps. So what's your favorite part here? Oh, so I didn't even talk about this, but we, so I, I made a really bad map on a place map with Zazzle. So I went to the San Francisco Earthquake Safety Fair, and I was like, I got a table, I got to bring something, like, what am I going to do? <coughs> talk about open street, well, open source map, and people are just like, ooh. So I was in an airport, and I went to Zazzle, and I printed out two neighborhoods as place maps, because I wanted something that was black. They're terrible. They're really awful maps. And I was like, at least I have something to give people. And we are making our first paper map from a community group that saw these and like wanted them. I was like, okay, these are terrible. But I mean, 
mean, I just literally took OSM, printed them on OSMAC on paper restaurant placemat. It's nice glossy paper and the format's like the weird like 19 by 24 or something. So what we're doing now, all they, it turns out what all they want are the building footprints in something that you can print in a grayscale that's 11 by 17. That's it. That, that's enough. Because again, you know, you need like something on a paper, like the, the, the one that I did of this area, it doesn't even have, it just has like very few street names even, but it's like, if you're trying to figure out just sort of where to go, that's enough. And that was all they wanted. So it was really hard because we had to take a lot of stuff to this off. I tell you, there's basically nothing but the building footprints on this map. So um, OSMatic has been really great, but basically for these, we're just um, using, I think the footprint from SF Open Data and QGIS and printing these neighborhoods. That's so, so do you, you know, do you just print them on a, on a home printer? Or so the idea is that you should be able to print them from anywhere. Um, and they scale to 24 or to 36, so people can go nuts. But the idea is, again, you've got to be able to just, anybody has to be able to bang them out. They should look, you should be, they should be fine in black and white. Um, yeah. They, and you should be able to just bang them out in a bed, you know, Kinko's or whatever. That was what they, yeah. Because again, I think the problem with that neighborhood map that you saw before is like, what even, what is that? Like, how would you print that? Like, you can't read it, you know? And again, people will spend days going out to do these things and not think about what they're actually, the map that they're actually going to end up with that's like this, right? Yeah. <laughs> do you distribute the maps in any way, like beforehand, as like a pardon? Do you distribute the maps in any way, but beforehand, like as a preparation measure, so that they're in places before the power goes out? That's yeah. That's the idea. I mean, that's one of the things I hope to get people doing, so they think about being able to go to OSMatic or you know anything and just printing out a map of the area that they need before before stuff happens, because you could definitely use a map with the building footprints for damage control, which is another thing that the nerds are also trained to do. Light search and rescue, which I'm kind of like, I don't know. I mean, I've had the training, but I'm like, mm. uh, because the main thing of all of these nerd things is just not be a victim. Don't die. Don't get yourself killed. Don't do anything foolish. You're not going to, you know, but yeah, you, you, that's the idea, really. Yeah. Yeah. In their daily lives. I wonder if there's been any thought given to cache offline maps that can quickly be shared using uh, tools yeah. unlike yeah. Uh, cell networks exactly. or public internet, airdrop things, exactly. and file exchange. That way you could rapidly share some nerd research. Definitely. Tools, yeah. Usable maps across a population range that can be shared kind of by a role. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, one of the things that we were definitely working on is they should be available offline in some format. But yeah, that's definitely an idea too. And I think when, when the thing about OSM is that when you start talking to people, they get it. It's just that they it's not the map they have on their phone. And the map you have on your phone is getting you everywhere. It's doing everything for you. And so you're like, oh, I have to learn this thing and it's just I don't understand and it's a database. Like what are these tags? And like so yeah, that that's another thing that we're doing for sure. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you.